Welcome to the New Books Network. As we become farmers, trying to settle down and raise crops, trying to ward off predators, trying to keep the crop going uh, with bad weather, floods, natural forces become sort of an enemy of the farmer. For example, what had been a sacred forest to these people, maybe they needed more cropland, so they have to find a way to remove parts of the sacred forest to create more cropland. We have to move from seeing animals as powerful and special and spiritual beings and as kinfolk to seeing them as tools and objects. We have to come up with mythologies that demote animals from being, I use the word loosely, gods, or that is special powers to uh, commodities, from gods to commodities. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the New Books in Animal Studies special series on the New Books Network. My name is Mark Malloy, and I'm the reviews editor at Make Literary Magazine. The focus of my contribution to this Animal Studies special series will be animal rights. I'm talking today with Jim Mason. Jim is an attorney, journalist, lecturer, and author. He was introduced to philosopher Peter Singer in 1974. The next year, they began discussing the possibility of collaborating on a book-length treatment of factory farming. Mason did much research on factory farming and traveled around the United States and Canada, visiting intensive farming facilities. Their book, Animal Factories, was first published in 1980 and revised in 1990. It provides a critical review and photographic documentation of factory farming practices in North America. The book is known for having played a role in the United States, similar to that of Ruth Harrison's 1964 classic Animal Machines in the United Kingdom and Europe, in providing a critical expose on the factory farm system. In 2006, Mason authored The Way We Eat, Why Our Food Choices Matter, also co-written with Peter Singer. Other writings have appeared in the New York Times, Newsday, Audubon, New Scientist, and others. In addition to writing, Jim Mason speaks about animals, nature, and the environment at conferences, churches, and universities. Today, I will be speaking to Jim about his book, An Unnatural Order, Uncovering the Roots of Our Domination of Nature and Each Other. Originally published in 1993 by Simon & Schuster, then in 1998 by Continuum, and again in 2004 by Lantern, and a revised edition is expected out next year. An Unnatural Order is a masterpiece and a classic of animal rights literature. The book explores from an anthropological, sociological, and holistic perspective how and why we have cut ourselves off from other animals and the natural world, and the toll this has taken on our consciousness, our ability to steward nature wisely, and the will to control our own tendencies. An unnatural order is a provocative search for the basic beliefs of Western culture that feed racism, sexism, animal exploitation, and domination of the natural world. Jim Mason begins this search nearly 10,000 years ago, when plants and animals were first domesticated or brought under human control. Until this time, people saw themselves as members of the natural world. They saw animals as kindred beings, and the living world as full of ensouled powers. The main theme of the book is that animals are much more important than we think. Under our current worldview, animals are trivial, except when they are useful. They're inferior beings, and, we think, they could not be important to human society except as food and slaves. But for hundreds of millennia, animals have been very much on the human mind. Animals have fed the mind and the imagination, especially our ideals about the living world, for a very long time. We lived in the presence of animals as we were evolving into human beings. To early humans, animals were the lively, 
moving parts of the mysterious living world. They were the most fascinating things in the world. Like us, animals ate, drank, slept, mated, eliminated, and died. They were familiar. They gave us a sense of continuity with other life. They gave us a sense of belonging in the living world. The huge variety of activities and patterns in animals' lives gave the developing human mind much to think about. In other words, animals have figured greatly in the shaping of our views of the world. Little wonder, then, that animals were the main figures in early art and myth. Then, between 10,000 and 8,000 BC, the first agriculture started in the ancient Middle East. Very slowly at first, farming began to replace foraging throughout the ancient world. Gradually, as population, cities, and human demand swelled, farming intensified. That is, farmers increased their control over animals and nature. As they did so, they had to tear down the very old beliefs in the sanctity and ensouled powers of the living world. In their place, farming societies built the myth of human supremacy, and with it the idea of the need to dominate the living world. In time, values on domination control, and hierarchy became ingrained in agrarian culture, and the agrarian worldview became the modern worldview. Our cultural heritage, then, is one that alienates us from the living world, one that regards it as a slave. This stuns human empathy and crushes any sense of kinship with other life. Moreover, our nature-dominating worldview causes some dominant people to regard women, people of color, and others as inferior, as closer to nature than to humanity. It also causes us to regard as inferior physical, emotional, sexual, and other animal aspects of human life, for these remind us of our closeness to animals and nature. Jim Mason contends that these dominionist views are at the bottom of society's ever-deepening social and ecological crises. It is vital, he believes, to revive the long-lost sense of kinship with animals and nature. An updated edition of An Unnatural Order is expected to be published in March 2021 by Lantern Press. Welcome, Jim, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Mark. Thanks. So, first off, your book is a masterpiece. As I think I mentioned to you, even though I'm interviewing you today on behalf of the New Books Network's Animal Studies special series, my main home at the New Books Network has been their Intellectual History Channel. So your book is right up my alley. And I have to say, I think it's an absolutely convincing account of the origins of what can be called the, the Western worldview. It's often said that we as humans desire to understand. And if the listener would like to understand so much, that is essential to who we are in the Western world and the problems that have historically plagued us and that continue to plague us. I will refer them to your book and the discussion we're about to have. So bravo and thank you for writing this amazing, amazing book. I loved it. Oh, thank you. As a way to begin, I was wondering if you could just tell us a bit about yourself, your background, training, and how you came to write this book. Okay, well, I was born in 1940 in Wisconsin. My parents have pretty quickly moved to the Ozarks of southwestern Missouri. I was about a year old, and I was brought up on a farm uh, during the World War II period. And I remember some of that rationing and the you know the hardships of uh, that that period. And I had. As I look back, I had a lot of really unpleasant experiences uh, as a farm kid because of the things that we had to do with animals. Very painful to me. And I think it uh, empowers and motivates me to this day. So farm background, I was the youngest of three boys. I went on to college as a pre-med and switched to law school and practiced law for a while. But I never really got over, <laughs> so to speak, my farm background. It's uh, still with me today. It's it's interesting that your farm background is a motivator. I, I think it that it can often seem that that it's the people that live in the cities that grew up that did not grow up on the farm 
take most easily to the kind of animal rights mentality. It seems a bit paradoxical the way that that can work. That's true. Um, I buried some of that trauma uh, until I was in my early 40s. And then uh, relationships that I made at that time and 40 year old person um, began to recover some of the horrors that I'd experienced as a farm kid, uh, namely some of the painful things that we had to do to animals. And uh, one telling incident for me was I was always very upset when we would see roadkill along the highway. I remember to this day that my parents would get pretty upset because whenever we'd see a dead animal, uh, they know that I would have a strong reaction to that. It was um, hard for me. But some of that started coming out again when I became 40 and uh, allowed myself to review and recover and remember some of the bad stuff that happened as a child. It isn't easy necessarily to re-engage and to revisit those things from the past. So I'm, I'm grateful that you did. Okay, so the argument of your book is very nuanced and very persuasive in its details. And I'm going to try to work through it in detail. But before we do that, I often find it's helpful to start with a, just a top-level overview so the listener can have the general picture in mind to better understand the more granular discussion we're about to have. So to begin, could you try to quickly summarize the general thesis of your book? Well, yes, I started trying to understand how we see animals and their attitude toward other animals somewhere along in the 1980s, I think it was. I just finished the book Animal Factories, which was all about factory farming. So I tried to read as much as I could about the origins of our views toward animals. And it quickly branched off into just looking at our entire worldview of human supremacy and exceptionalism. So I started to read all about that. And I read and took notes for like 12 years. So the gist of the book is to try to understand how we came to think the way we do about the world in which we live and what we call our world view. And I had to trace not only, you know, some 5,000 years of history, but looked into some prehistory as well, anthropology particularly. You, you certainly read widely. For the, for the listener... The book, I think, is in, in many ways somewhat similar to Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, yes. although that book was published in 1997, and your book, A Natural Order, was published in 1993. And whereas Guns, Germs, and Steel argues that the Eurasian civilization grew dominant due to advantages in the crops and domesticated animals that that just happened to be native in that area as opposed to elsewhere, South, South America, something like that. And that is why the Western world emerged out of that. But the focus of Diamond's book is an impartial study of why that dominance came to pass, whereas an unnatural order looks to the deep past to understand the present, but you are, this is not, I would not say this is impartial, although I, I think that it somewhat is impartial, but there is a, a sense of reckoning involved. And you were trying to understand the origins of our hatred of animals, as well as our misogyny and racism. And you find them in the rise of agriculture, and in particular, the rise of organized animal herding, animal domestication, and hunting. And the way that you tell that story, that, 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 is, your, that is your book, and it's an extraordinary account that you give. Let's start at the beginning with pre-agricultural humans. You quote George B. Leonard as writing that, quote, the transition from forager to farmer was the seed of alienation between humankind and nature, end quote. So please take us back before the transition. Humans were foragers. That, that seems to be really the key idea before agriculture, foraging. Could you tell us a bit about what we know about pre-agricultural men? Well, that's the longest part of our existence as uh, humans. Our species is, uh, current species is about 200,000 years old, but before that, 
for some, uh, I think up to 5 million years, we were hominids and we lived in nature and we had culture and we had thoughts, we had minds. They became progressively sharper as we became modern humans, the, the current species. But essentially we lived in nature mostly naked most of the time, outdoors most of the time. We were exposed to all of the elements most of the time, especially seeing animals, not only hunting animals, but just living among them and hearing their sounds day and night and seeing the sights of animals and the things that they do in, in the world around wherever we were at, you know, back in the day. So we were really living as part of the living world. We were one member of the family of animals living in the world, and we didn't see ourselves as so much separate, as distinct from them. We saw kinship. In fact, if you study the anthropology of tribal people, nearly all of them have the idea of totemism and animism, which is that they see themselves as somehow kin to the other animals around them. And Sometimes one of the more important animals in their environment would be what they called a totem animal. And that animal was sometimes considered to be an ancestor of the tribe. And uh, that totem animal would be the animal figure that was not quite a deity, not quite sacred, but powerful. And it would be the figure that gave the tribe permission to hunt and kill other animals. So this is the relationship that we had for the longest part of our existence. And when I say the longest part, if you look at time measured, say on a yardstick or a meter, a meter is a thousand millimeters. And if we take our five million years as humans, as hominids, put that on a meter stick, then one millimeter is comes out to 5,000 years of existence. Well, one millimeter of 5,000 years of existence is, is simply the historical period. So, and it's not even a, a very big part of our existence as modern humans. So the point of that metaphor is to show you how long we lived as foragers before we became farmers. We became farmers only about 10,000 years ago, and that's two millimeters on the scale. And that's a tiny part of our entire existence. So it's important to understand how we were, how we looked upon the world during that longest period of our existence as humans, and then what happened when we changed from foraging to farming and living in settled conditions in, in towns and cities. Right, so hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. These are the time scales over which natural selection can actually can work. And so the people that we are today, our, our genes were built up over those types of time scales. That, that is who we still are. Over the, of course, over the last 10,000 years, enormous changes have happened. And that, that is the point of your book. But before that starts, 10, 12,000 years ago, we are mostly foraging for plants. We are living very close to the natural world. We view ourselves as part of the natural world. And that, that is where our story begins. Still in pre-agricultural times, I'd like you to talk to us about female power and status during that period. You argue that in many ways, these pre-agricultural societies were largely matriarchal. Could you talk to us about this? Yes, uh, Mark, I'm careful about not using the term matriarchal because what that does is that suggests some sort of mirror image to what we know as patriarchy, which is male ruled. I would prefer not to use the term matriarchal because of its association with patriarchy, which it really wasn't in those times. It's, it's more accurate to say that it was a female-centered world because the female power in, the, in those primitive times came from not really understanding the role of males in reproduction, in sex and pregnancy and birth. So having babies was a female mystery. 
and it was considered one of the sources of female power. And women, uh, if you look at the anthropology of that period, women brought in most of the food. People didn't live on hunting alone. Some studies of uh, primitive societies, what we call primitive, but primal, I prefer to call them, most of the food was gathered by women and children. So women had power by virtue of their essential femaleness and their being center of the tribe and the hearth. And um, males had to respect that. So most of the power of the females comes naturally just by virtue of their female biology. And uh, another thing that bothered societies at the time is that women bled and menstruated. And uh, that was feared because blood was powerful substance back in those days. So women bled but did not die. So they had a lot of kinds of sources to their power. Uh, food gathering, bearing children, basically keeping the family unit fed and protected. So that's the source of female power. So I, I don't necessarily call it a matriarchy because females didn't have to use the kind of strong arm tactics that the patriarchs did to rule the um, the unit, the social unit. Point taken, uh, a very important distinction. Thank you for pointing that out. You make a very compelling case in your book that animals both were and still are more important to humans than we realize. Originally, this stemmed from our ancestors' animism, the attribution of a soul to plants, natural phenomena, and in particular animals. And you write that, quote, the primal relationship with the powers of the living world was more of a partnership in which the human beings had interactions and a strong sense of interdependence with animals, end quote. Your argument here leans on biologist Paul Shepard's incredible book, Thinking Animals, Animals and the Development of Human Intelligence. Briefly, his argument is that humans need animals to learn to think because human brains and thought processes grew up on animals. Could you talk us through Shepard's fascinating thesis and the light it sheds on just how important animals are to humans and, in fact, how much they contributed to making us who we are today? Yes, uh, Shepard's book uh, was, in fact, the most important thing I read that caused me to start writing my own book, because it dawned on me from reading Shepard's book that our minds, our human minds, literally grew up on the animals around us. Now, what does that mean? That means that as we were living in this world, naked and exposed to the world around us, Animals were the most stimulating thing out there. They were the moving parts of the living world. Everything else is silent and rather still. But animals are animated. They're moving. They're doing things. And it's important to notice how this might have been received by the minds of our primal ancestors. And I'm talking hundreds of thousands of years back. The budding human mind saw the world around them and the animals in it as alive and ensouled and full of mysterious powers. And most of those mysterious powers centered on the things that animals could be observed doing. And this is where it was very stimulating to that budding primitive human mind. Animals were doing things that we would recognize and would be familiar to us. This is puzzling. Animals eat and they chase and they run and they are seen having sex and they have babies and they bleed and they die. And they do all of the things that humans were observing in their own human society. So this must have been incredibly puzzling to the budding human mind. And this is where the, the central idea of the powers of animals, the spiritual mysterious powers of animals gets embedded embedded in the human mind at an early stage. And this is reflected in the creation stories of uh, primal peoples. And these have been looked at by anthropologists, looked at different tribal societies the world over, and they have a lot of things in common. But the most important thing they have in common is that animals were the first beings 
and they were considered the beings that brought humans to the world and taught them how to live. This is a very powerful idea, and it's reflected in creation stories. And it seems to be some evidence of what Shepard tried to explain, is that animals are simply the most important things in the world outside of the human group. And it, I, I'm not sure if he explicitly says this, but one thing that I took from, from the argument is that it's conceivable that the human brain is physically hardwired to incorporate animals some, to some degree into its development. Uh, and that is why when you look, it's, you know, it's one of those things that you don't really pay too much attention to until you, it's pointed out to you, but it is true that everywhere you go, where there are, in the present world today, where there are children, they're surrounded by animals in, in the TV programs they watch, in the books that they read, in the toys that they have, on the sheets on their bed. And so the argument, as I understand it, is that because over hundreds of thousands or even millions of years going deep into deep prehistory of humans, it's always been part of the childhood development to develop in response to observing the behavior of these animals outside of it. So we are literally hardwired. We, it, we potentially could not do it without them. You think the argument goes that far? Yes, I do. And I think Shepard explains that uh, hardwiring. He says the human brain, when we're born, the human brain is not fully developed. It really uh, needs information and input to become fully developed and formed so that the thought processes which break down into language and speech and all kinds of functions of, of having a mind and, and using tools and having the mind guide our lives. We have to be fed for the brain to develop properly. And he says animals were perfect for that because they're so puzzling. They're puzzling. They're familiar because they do things that are familiar to us, and yet they're different. They're like other beings, different nations, different tribes, different people, as it were. And this puzzles the human brain and forces the human brain to try to understand things. And animals come in different sizes and shapes. And one essential stage in the development of the mind is to sort things that we experience and classify them. This is what the child, the infant mind is trying to do as it encounters the environment around it. It tries to put things in their place, so to speak. And animals were perfect for this because they come in sets. There are the lions, there are the elephants, there are the trees. There are things that come in groups. And this is how the, the, the budding, developing human mind begin, begins to see the world. And animals are so important to that. They help us form categories and classes and help us sort of understand a, a sense of order in the world. So this is why animals have so much power to us and why, as you say, they are embedded in the human brain. And evidence of this is in our language. We, animals are very powerful in language. As I think I pointed out in one of my essays, we have so many words where we use animals to either exaggerate or to impress or to disgrace or somehow to use animal expressions to empower our language. For example, we call people a rat, somebody is, acts like a wolf. Uh, this is in our mythology. Animals empower our speech and our stories in a way that nothing else does because they are so embedded in our, in our minds. Okay, so animals are absolutely crucial to who we are as humans. And perhaps the listener can anticipate where we're going with this. We are now approaching the, the break from animals. So let's move into the transition to agriculture. This happens, I believe, between 10,000 to maybe 13,000 years ago. Um, you don't have to get into the psychic or political implications yet. I will be asking you about that. But okay. for now, just the general picture that maybe an archaeologist would tell what are the general dates what's the if if possible i assume maybe this is dispersed but the general location 
how does how do we transition into planting agriculture as well as herding? It's believed to have happened about 10,000 years ago in the Middle East. It's argued that there's evidence that some of the first plant agriculture was basically selective foraging, that the tribe that lived in a region would know where the stand of wild wheat or barley could be uh, collected um, yearly. Uh, so they would re there would be a recurring um, foraging activity to that area because that's where they that knew they could find the grain. Why do people start settling down and cultivating that stand of wild barley? Well, everything I've read suggests that it had to do with population growth and density. And if you look at the places where agriculture began, it tends to occur around water, around rivers, uh, swamps, wetlands, places where there's a plentiful food supply. So this would be a place where the population would tend to grow and stay put more or less, sort of semi-sedentary, so to speak. Well, over time, there simply became too many numbers and people became what anthropologists call circumscribed. That is, they couldn't move out very far to forage for distant food sources. So they had to kind of stay put where they were and intensify their food gathering. And that period led to them learning how to actually tend, that is cultivate that wild stand of wheat or barley so that it became domesticated over time, domestic wheat. And then from that, they learned to scatter seeds, how to, how to create their own crop lands. And then they would learn to clear forests and, and create irrigation systems to grow more of that crop of wheat or barley. So it had to do with population density, population accumulation in, a, in a, what had been a food rich area. So they were sort of forced into agriculture. Now on the animal side of it, that takes place in about, at about the same time in the same place. It's believed in what's now Northern Iraq when uh, some of the tribes began to concentrate their hunting on some of the herd animals that lived in that area, which were sheep and goats. It's where the plains meet the mountains. So they began to specialize in hunting either sheep or goats and focused their hunting techniques to the point where they were preying perhaps on the same herd year after year, perhaps selectively taking an animal or two at certain seasons. And if you multiply this by centuries, they learned to actually control that herd. They would follow its movements most of the time, and then some of the time they might actually steer that herd towards greener pastures and water, so to speak. So over time, that herd of sheep or goats tends to become thought of as the tribe's own animals. And they're already pretty well into what we call domestication, which progresses into what we call animal husbandry, which is controlling the growth of the herd through controlling the reproductive cycles of the herd, which is physically controlling the male and female members of the herd, separating them, allowing breeding seasons only at certain times of the year, learning to shape the animals for better wool or bigger horns or a different coat color, animal husbandry begins to emerge out of that. Perfect. Crucial to note here that, uh, as you note in your book, this wasn't necessarily perceived at the time as movement in the right direction. You write, quote, the new breeds of plants and animals were not very reliable providers of food and materials. Domestic species were vulnerable to diseases and pests. And I would imagine uh, humans also were increasingly susceptible to diseases. Farming methods were crude and not very productive. Slowly creeping sedentism and farming took over, bringing drudgery, monotony, crowding, famine, disease, bad teeth, and lots of new grounds for violence between individuals and groups, end quote. This transitions us into Genesis, which is the 
note upon which you begin your book, and I, I think this is one of the most extraordinary insights in your book. This really blew my mind. So in Genesis, we read famously that man shall have, quote, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, end quote. This is, we are told, a divine mandate. And yet, you write, quote, Genesis was not written by the hand of God. It was written by men, real men in real cities in the Middle East on real days in history, end quote. This is an extremely important point. The ethics and morality encoded in Genesis, as well as in the classics of the ancient Western world, including ancient Greece, are the ethics of an agrarian culture who was still struggling to subdue the land and the animals they lived among. In Genesis, you write, quote, the soil, the earth, is base and low, something to rise above. The earth is not exactly evil, but it is low and contemptible, end quote. What a change from the herder time. In this sense, we can read Genesis and the classical authors not as sources of divine wisdom, but instead as channels by which the agrarian worldview was formalized and imposed upon the world. Can you talk to us quickly about the, the worldview of Genesis and help us see how it reflects the values of those early years of agriculture? Yes, it's uh, it, interesting to note that this worldview, uh, Genesis was written by Hebrew scribes, and the Hebrews were one of many herdskeeping people in the Middle East at that time. They were just better writers than the other um, herds people, which uh, anthropologists call pastoralists. And uh, it's known from anthropology that the worldview of uh, one God, of a monotheistic deity that supervises and controls human life and gives human life a code to live by, that is the worldview that comes from herds people. And anthropologists have actually measured this empirically when they look at all the different primal societies. It's the herds people that come up with the idea of an all-powerful God. And a lot of the imagery in the Bible suggests this. If, the, if you'll note how much the imagery of the shepherd and the flock runs throughout the Bible, because the worldview of the Hebrews, as with many other herding societies, was shaped by their relationship with their animals. So that humans begin to see their God as a great shepherd, tending and caring for them just as they tended to care for their flocks, the great shepherd in the sky, so to speak. Now, another interesting part of Genesis is the banishment from the Garden of Eden. And this reflects a kind of view at the time that agriculture was the movement to agriculture wasn't such a great idea that it brought the hardship that you described that life was better in the earlier time in the garden of eden and some of the evidence of the study of forager people shows that generally they had better health and better diets than a lot of the societies did in the early agricultural period before farming practices were more evolved and perfected so there's the belief in a lot of the societies soon after the transition that they'd made a huge mistake, as Jared Diamond pointed out in an essay, that agriculture was the greatest mistake in the history of the human race. So that, that's reflected in the Genesis um, Garden of Eden myth. And, and, this, and interestingly, um, they blame it on woman. A woman is the trouble causer that tempts Adam through sex, perhaps, to eat the forbidden fruit. So you get a lot of interesting um, images and metaphors in the creation myth that we have that one is that agriculture turned out to be kind of a bad deal for humans for quite a while. I was absolutely going to zero in on that. I'm interested in literary criticism, and, and I believe that this reading of Adam and Eve is, is really a masterpiece of, of literary criticism. If I could just just quickly quote from your book, the essential message of our creation story, something grave and sorrowful happened to human existence. Our civilization's most important myth, then, reflects human awareness of a major transition, a great change in the human way of life. Some think that the oldest oral versions of the myth were put together relatively early in the agricultural era, 
when much still remains of the earlier forager hunter-gatherer culture in life ways. The overall theme of the myth expresses the longing for an early agricultural people for their earlier, easier, freer forager way of life. So beyond just arguing that the Bible gives humans dominion over the rest of life on earth, you argue that agriculture breeds misotherapy or the hatred and contempt of animals, a term that I believe you coined. It does this for practical reasons. Humans now have to devote enormous amounts of time and energy battling the living world around them to domesticate it into a world that serves them. They needed to remove their earlier animistic beliefs in the animal spirit powers and replace them with beliefs that would permit more deliberate exploitation. And misotherapy also arises, you argue, out of guilt. The early farmers and herders still lived partially in an animistic world in which the animals were ensouled, and so they developed misotherapy as a distancing device to assuage their guilt. Can you talk to us a bit about the origins of misotherapy during this time? Yes, I, I think it should be pronounced misothery, sort of rhyming with misogyny. Gotcha. And the word misogyny is what gave me the idea for it. This, these are taken from Greek uh, root words. Uh, misogyny means literally woman hating. And so I tried to find a word in the English language that was similar to woman hating that meant nature hating. And I looked at the roots and there's a word therio, which is, the, I think it's the Greek root word for animals. So I combined miso with theory, misothery, which is literally hatred of animals, but because animals were so powerful, so emblematic, so representative of nature, the living world in general, misothery means not only animal hating, but generally nature hating, contempt for the living world around us. Because as we become farmers, trying to settle down and raise crops, trying to ward off predators, trying to keep the crop going uh, with bad weather, floods, natural forces become sort of an enemy of the farmer. For example, what had been a sacred forest to these people, maybe they needed more cropland, so they have to find a way to remove parts of the sacred forest to create more cropland. So they have to move from sort of revering and respecting the living world around them seeing it as a kin, a kin folk, to seeing that living world around them as a competitor, as something to be controlled, just the way they control their crops and their herds. They needed to find a new attitude toward the world that gave them the power to change these things out there that used to be considered sacred. So they had to really invent all kinds of new mythologies to be able to do this. There had to be a great psychic upheaval in the way we saw the world as, and a real upheaval in the world view. And this is what Jared Diamond talks about when he says it's the greatest mistake in the human species to go from that forager, nature-loving, nature-awed view to that of a farmer who wants to control and conquer all of that that's uh, competitive to him competing against the predators that are preying on the flock of sheep or goats, competing with the natural forces of the elements, rain and, and, and floods and so forth. So that's what begins to reshape the worldview. Nature becomes seen in a, in a wholly different way by the farmer and the herds, uh, the herds people. Mazothery becomes important in doing that because we have to move from seeing animals as powerful and special and spiritual beings and as kinfolk to seeing them as tools and objects. They have to be, go from, we have to come up with mythologies that demote animals from being, I use the word loosely, gods, or that is special powers to uh, commodities, from gods to commodities, to things to be bought and sold and killed and traded. You quote Cotton Mather as emblematic of this new worldview when he writes, what is not useful is vicious. And an extraordinary 
comment. Although the still, I would say the general uh, the general Western mindset still an emblematic comment as to where where we stand. Things that are good are things that aid human life, and things that are bad are things that do not aid human life. Would you mind now walking us through the transition from small bands of foragers to towns and the rise of the warrior class that comes with them? You write, quote, around a center of Israel and Iraq, all of the major herd animals were domesticated. All of these places of domestication spawned herder subcultures, that is, pastoral, nomadic peoples whose cultures we describe as expansionistic, individualistic, militaristic, arrogant, male-dominated, and patriarchal. Add to their mobility and speed, they were all, they were horse riders, the aggressive, domineering nature of their culture, and we can assume that these prehistoric herder peoples were, to put it mildly, very influential in shaping the agriculture all around the Middle Eastern center, end quote. Why does a warrior class come from the rise of agriculture, and what role did herder culture play in this, in, in the rise of the Western warrior mentality? At the time when I wrote about that, it was sort of theoretical that the warrior class probably arose from the herds people because they were uh, armed and more powerful and competing with each other for space, water, and grass. But it's been shown empirically, that is, by looking at at ancient societies, both ancient and, and modern contemporary cultures, that the herds people tend to be the most aggressive and the most uh, warlike, uh, belligerent. And we see this in the herds cultures in recent times, whether they be in uh, Asia and the, the herds people of Asia or in Northern Africa, the cattle herds people, they, they're very competitive with each other. And the reason for that is that their animals need two things on a daily basis. They need grass and they need water. And when you're living with a herd of animals, and sometimes the herd can number in the hundreds, you have to be always on the move looking for more grass and water for your herds. And this would be in a region where there were lots of other herds people and sedentary farmers trying to grow their crops, their barley and their wheat in the floodplains. So the herds people could be kind of a pest uh, in, a, in an environment like that. And they wouldn't be able, a, a particular tribe wouldn't be able to build its wealth, which was measured in the numbers of animals, by the way, which is where the word capital comes from. The head count, the number of animals is the measure of wealth. The tribe wouldn't be able to maintain its wealth if they didn't keep that herd uh, growing, healthy on grass and water. So they would always have to compete with their neighbors for space. And out of this arose a kind of a, a warrior mentality that they really are always on the alert. And this has been measured too. Paul Shepard writes about this in his books, as do other uh, anthropologists and sociologists. The herds people are the ones that would be dominating an area. And um, and if you look at the at the at the wars, the tribal wars between the towns and city states. In early prehistory, a lot of that was uh, wars for for animals, for cattle, and for captives from the rival city. If you look at some of the early books of the Bible, when they talk about how the Hebrews uh, marched into the promised land to claim space, they wiped out entire tribes. And it says in the Bible that they slew them, every woman and child, but they saved the livestock. And sometimes they would... Uh, neutralize the men through castration or blinding so that they wouldn't have to fight them. And they took the women and the children as captives and made them into slaves. And slavery, by the way, is an element if you study the culture of herds people. We get uh, key ideas in herder cultures. One is the idea of an all-powerful god, a monotheist view, uh, slavery, patriarchy, because Attending of animals tends to be male work. It tends to be male wealth. The males of the tribe are considered the owners of the herd. 
and females take on a secondary role, and uh, females are the ones that are captured and enslaved. So females become a slave class in those kind of cultures. So a whole lot of our worldview, our modern worldview of patriarchy and slavery and warmongering and militarism comes from the worldview of the prehistoric and early historic herds people, not just the Hebrews, but all of the tribes people like the Hebrews that roamed throughout Northern Africa and what we consider now the Middle East, which was a site of the, domestic, the domestication of most of the major species, sheep, goats, cattle, horses. Right. So you're, you're speaking about the, the rise of the, the warrior culture and, and with it patriarchy in terms of the, the contemporary challenges that, that they were facing. But in your book that you, you were able to push that back even earlier in, in contrast to what you had established in pre-agrarian society. You had brought up the fact that males were probably jealous of the powers that women were viewed to have due to their, their closeness with nature, their um, child giving, childbirth capabilities. So there's that jealousy. You note that the female powers were perceived to as with greater understanding of the procreation process and fatherhood, some of the female powers were perceived to be a bit demystified. And then leading into the present, there's surplus wealth. Wealth becomes a real thing. You, In the beginning of your answer, you focused on battling for grass and stuff. But there was also, as, as you did mention, there was also battling to take other people's horses. Yes, and cattle. And... Also, there is just some role of simply the horse. The horse, as you note, is a warrior's animal. The horse moves quickly and is powerful. Ten people on horses could, could, could defeat an army of 100 on foot. You argue that racism and colonialism also arise out of agricultural society. Could you talk us through this? Yes, I think uh, we have to understand that, that the herder culture leads to the warrior culture and patriarchal culture, which is very man-centered and militaristic. And an important element in that was the discovery of fatherhood. That is the discovery that and the, the, the coming, I wouldn't say the discovery, but the coming to understand that males, men, had a role in reproduction. Because before that, it had been a, a female mystery. They didn't understand that men fertilized women and created pregnancy and birth. So when men began to, when societies began to, to tend their animal herds, when they began to do animal husbandry, it dawned on the entire society, probably both men and women, over the course of time that males had something to do with pregnancy and birth. So this sort of took, took away some of the female power and enhance the powers of men. So that's part of an important part of the transition into the patriarchal worldview. The other thing is that women come to be demoted through myth. And if you look at uh, our creation myth in Genesis, uh, women were demoted by, in the figure of Eve, who brought trouble to the world by tempting Adam. And in the Greek myth of Pandora, Pandora opened the box of trouble and released it to the world. So again, a female is seen as being um, a trouble causer and bringing woe and strife and, and hardship to society. And uh, so we see a lot of myths that begin to in the early agricultural period, actually probably in the early historical period, that begin to remove the status of women from powers to slavery. Slavery had a lot to do with that too, because when women are in general are seen as a slave class, as captives subject to enslavement, that demotes their status as well. So all, all the while this is occurring, societies, is, societies in the ancient Middle East is getting more crowded. It's getting more dense. There are a lot of social conflicts between tribes and settled farmers and towns and cities. So we get the period of the early history period where we have the wars between the city-states, which were wars for control of, an, of uh, resources of an area and market uh, trading routes and trading centers. So out of that, you have the need for 
what we've come to call government, which is some kind of authority in the society to kind of civilize things and govern things and try to prevent war and to try to prevent crime. And it seems that in this period of social formation, we began to see the more powerful men, the patriarchs and their followers who followed the powerful patriarch leader become the heads of, of, the, of the social group, the heads of the tribe, the heads of the town, the heads of the local society, the, the chiefs. And out of these powerful men comes the warrior class. And the warrior class, they're the most skilled at domination. They know how to maneuver. They know how to raid other people for their female slaves and their livestock. That's an interesting word, livestock, which is wealth. So they steal wealth from their neighbors and they steal slaves from their neighbors. And it takes really like skilled warrior people to do this. So they become the dominant characters in these primitive societies. And throughout the ancient Middle East civilizations, so the early civilized societies, the Sumerians and um, the Hittites and the Canaanites and all of the, the, the emerging civilized centers in the Mesopotamia are pretty much uh, governed by and controlled by and led by, dominated by the, the herds people because of their war skills. And how about, um, how about racism though? I, what I have in mind in particular is, is what you write about the great chain of being as well as okay. breed, the concept of breed purity. Well, from the culture of husbandry and herding, we get this obsession with bloodlines and breed improvement. And this is a very old tradition. Throughout the history of animal husbandry, we've been constantly specializing the breeding of animals into milk cows, beef cows, sheep that grow special wool. And look at, you know, just even the non-agricultural animals like the dog, the way we've controlled the breeding of through selective breeding, the shapes and the sizes and the looks of animals for centuries. So we have much of that value embedded in the culture of the uh, herds people of uh, domestication. And, and we have to have a sense of that in our own society as well. We get the idea of breed purity from our controlling of the breeds of animals. And the misophery that we carry in our culture, which is contempt for nature and animals, when Europeans full of misophery and full of herdskeeper ideas began to encounter the rest of the world around the time of Columbus, uh, 1400s, when they began to sail out and discover, is the word, when they began to encounter other areas of the world that were unknown to them, the North American continent, Central America, the Caribbean islands, the rest of Africa, which was forbidden to them because it was too difficult to penetrate. Europeans began to see these, quote, wild, unquote, untamed, unquote, civil, uncivilized places as full of wild animals and danger because it was full of nature that they could not control or had not yet learned to control. So as we began to go out into the into the non-European world, we encounter nature raw and uncivilized, and it's populated by people that don't look like us, that are unfamiliar to us, and they're seen as animals. In fact, that was a big debate in, in Europe uh, after the encounters around the time of Columbus. Are they animals or are they just inferior humans? And curiously enough, it was the liberals of the time, the progressives, that argued that, oh, they're inferior humans. They're not animals. They have souls. They can be saved. So this attitude empowered the uh, colonizing of the new, the new world, we call it, and eventually much of Asia and Africa. The seeing of those places and those peoples through the lens of misothery which had hatred and contempt for nature in the living world that was yet uncontrolled, unsupervised. It was fearful, and it had to be hated and despised and controlled by the conquerors. So it's it, with this attitude that we see 
and encounter and learn to deal with these new wild places and their savage. In fact, that was the word they used, the savages of these places that were probably near the animal state. So just as you argue that agriculture contributes to misogyny and racism, you also argue that it is largely responsible for the natural catastrophes that we are currently witnessing, climate change, species collapse, etc. Could you talk us through the role that you see agriculture and the domestication of animals as playing in the destructions that we are wreaking on the planet today? Well, yes, we have to go start with the building blocks of our worldview, which are based on misothery, which is the idea that we're nature is a thing to be controlled, supervised, governed by us, and that we invented a god to basically license us to do that, in fact, to command us to do that. So wherever we see the living world, it's a thing for us. It's a commodity. It's a resource. In fact, sometimes I don't even like the word environment, which comes from the Greek word for surrounding. So we see the world as our environment, that which surrounds us. And again, it's a human-centered worldview. We don't see ourselves as part of it. We see it as a surrounding. And when we see the surrounding, we see things that we want and that we need. So we have learned to see the entire world as our oyster, as they say, full of resources. So that when we have a worldview like that, with hatred and contempt for nature, misothery, I call it, and we become more competitive with each other for parts and pieces of that world, fresh water, materials for our uh, ore, for metals that we need, uh, soil, space. We compete with each other and we we become powerful with each other and we overpower cultures that have things that we need. For example, now you find the more powerful nations are exploiting the so-called third world nations or the developing nations for their resources, for their uh, ore, for mining, and for their fresh water, and for their forests, for lumber. So that's how we take over the world because our worldview empowers us, entitles us, licenses us to do that. And where there are other people and societies in the way, we feel entitled to move them out of the way. And we did this specifically with the Native Americans of North America. Our worldview entitled us to literally adopt genocide, to remove the Indians from the plains, to make way for settlers and their farming and their livestock. This was American policy in the early to mid 19th century. And it's the same policies that other imperial powers, the Europeans and others, followed when they encountered the uncivilized, the savage parts of the world that were yet uncolonized. And out of that comes racism, too, because we had to see these people in these places as inferior to us, as not our equals. They had to be seen as animals so that we could comfortably, in a guilt-free way, and in fact, in a divine mandated way, remove them and get them out of the way. If we couldn't convert them to Christianity, we had to kill them and get them out of the way so that we could farm there and take those resources. So this is the story of colonization and uh, the subjugation of the people that lived in the colonial world. Racism, um, seeing them as inferiors had a lot to do with uh, empowering that it certainly comes out of that Cotton Mather quote, what is not useful is vicious. And also I think the way that we we trained or subjugated the empathy out of ourselves with the domestication of animals, we beat ourselves down to the point where we were unable to feel empathy towards animals in the natural world. And now we find ourselves in a situation where we're witnessing 
dangerous climate change, unprecedented, extraordinary species collapse. And, you know, we struggle to give a damn. It is difficult to summon the interest of people into even acknowledging that this is happening, let alone taking some type of response to it. I'm, I'm glad to hear you uh, relate uh, climate change to the worldview that we are trying to understand. Yes, the worldview directly empowers climate change. It's part of the divine mandate, which gives us human supremacy and exceptionalism. We tend to not care about the species that we're exterminating. They're not if they're not valuable to us for human survival and human improvement, it's okay to do that. In fact, the divine mandate wants us to do that. So essentially, climate change is being caused by this human supremacist idea that the world is ours to control, just as the prehistoric herds people thought that the grasslands and the water sources were theirs to control because it's what gave them the wealth of their flock allowed them to expand their flock of sheep. And we're doing that same way today by basically taking over all of the natural parts of the world. There's hardly any part of the world that's not being exploited now. We're even trying to think of ways to exploit the polar regions. We're trying to find if there's some way we can get something out of the north, uh, the Arctic and the uh, south, the Antarctic. Uh, we're trying to exploit every square inch of this planet because our numbers are so huge and our demands on the planet have grown exponentially so that we feel that we have to exploit everything in, in our power to improve our own human lot and our human way of life. And that through fossil fuels and other exploitative industries like uh, deforestation, of course, is a problem, and the uh, exploitation of fresh water. Uh, we're doing this all over the planet, and it's contributing to uh, climate change. And, and it must be seen that the prime cause of our impact on the planet that's causing climate change, the prime mover of that is this worldview of human supremacy and entitlement, the worldview that we inherited from our herdskeeping ancestors. It seems irrefutable to me. Your book ends on a somewhat hopeful note that revolves around what you call the animal question. Essentially, your entire book has documented the ways in which our progressive alienation from animals and the literally unimaginable scale of the violence we have perpetrated against our fellow creatures and our planet have in turn done immense damage to our own spiritual lives and ethics. You write that, quote, the animal question is central and fundamental to the nature question. We will simply not be able to come to terms with nature until we come to terms with animals and animality, end quote. Could you talk us through this? What steps do you, do you feel that we need to take to come to terms with the animal question, to begin to heal nature and to begin to heal ourselves? Well, I think we have to start with the fact that most people that are listening are, are already um, uh, have inherited a mindset of misothery and human supremacy. So they have to realize that the mindset that they've brought up, that they've been brought up on that's embedded in them now is probably going to keep them from understanding some of these things. It's blocking their view of the world as um, blocking them from understanding how central animals have been in our uh, development as a species and our development of our minds. So misothery is the barrier that they have to try to overcome. And the analogy would be for men who try to understand their dominance over women Sometimes their misogyny keeps them from thinking through the kinds of things that they have to do to understand their role in the exploitation and subjugation of females. So the prejudice that we've been brought up on is keeping, it, keeping us from understanding it. So number one, we have to work through the misogyny and the misothery that we have 
to try to understand the role that animals have played in the formation of our mind, our culture, our civilization, our, our notions of wealth and class, and to understand how central they have been to our the development of our minds as humans. Uh, the idea of the animal powers, the idea of animals in the creation stories of people the world over. We have to try to work through the mazothry that's in our minds to understand that animals have always been important in the human mind, in the human culture. And they are not things to be despised and hated and feared and considered as the ultimate other. We have to try to recover the primal worldview of seeing animals as kin folks, as kin to us. And this is not mysticism. This is not some theoretical nonsense. This is pure old biology. This is evolutionary biology. We are mammals. We are members of the great ape family. We are similar to chimpanzees and to the other great apes in ways that they're not similar to animals, uh, uh, other species. We have biologically demonstrated kinship with other beings. We have similarities in, in our blood chemistry. We have the same brain chemicals that cause depression and joy and the feelings of pleasure that other animals have. We need to use biology and science, which is unfortunately much under attack these days, but science will show us the reality of our kinship with other animals. And if we can like break through the mazothery that we've inherited, break through the mythology that tells us that we're superior beings and find the actual scientific biology that shows us how we are related to other creatures, then I think we would have a better sense of ourselves on this planet. We would not see ourselves as distinct and separate and alienated and overlords of nature, but we would see ourselves as a piece of it, as a member of it. And then we would probably be forced to think more carefully about what we're doing to the planet that feeds us and sustains us. It would give us a worldview of belonging to the world instead of the worldview of being a warrior as a superpower over that world. I could not agree more with your point about science and biology. I think that I, I always was sympathetic to the animal rights or animal liberation perspective. I've been a vegetarian since 1993, but one of the moments for me that was truly transformative was actually watching the Carl Sagan Cosmos television, which has nothing whatsoever on the surface to do with animals, really. But he does, he presents the history of life on Earth, and he shows how we really are, we really are all one family. He's talking about an oak tree, and he talks about how the, the genetic reader in the human body is able to read the genetic material of the oak tree. It can't build the same tree, but the, the reader is the same because we all come from the same place. We truly are all related, and I found that to be a, a transformative thought, and the impression it left upon me remains to this day. Yes, it's important to depart from the mysticism and the superstitions that we've been brought up on, the idea that God created the earth and he created us in his image and all of the mystical, unscientific claptrap of uh, dominant religions. They really are screwing up our sense of understanding ourselves in the world. We need to have a scientific, biological, realistic view of the world, of the role of carbon atoms and the things that you talk about that Carl Sagan and other um, and Jared Diamond and others have taught us. We have to come to terms with the real world and learn to not live by these superstitions. We have science now. We have evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology. We can understand our behavior and our living as mammals on this planet through those sciences and their specialties 
better than we can understand ourselves looking at superstitions, uh, ideas of being created by God in his image and all that re religious stuff. In fact, that clouds and, and, and distro distorts the way we see ourselves on this planet. We must come to see ourselves as another mammal, as one of the apes that lives on the planet, one that has a, just a little better intelligence and language and tool skills. And so we can adapt that to a, a better outlook that will guide us into a better way of living here and living more or less in harmony and a sense of kinship with the other life on the planet. I remember after watching Cosmos for the first time, I, I went through a period of shock because it intuitively, I intuitively understood that it was correct and it transformed my understanding of life and the world that I lived in. And there was a period where I was in shock, but that went away. And what remains is a sense of awe and beauty at the story that science has to tell. It, it really isn't all cold and mechanical and lifeless. It is a beautiful story of coevolution and life blossoming on earth under improbable circumstances and possibly elsewhere. I, I really would refer our listeners, just there's a million books, popular introductions to science, and many of them are wonderful. I still think that first original series of Cosmos with Carl Sagan is extraordinary. It holds up very well. It is mostly still current. They redid it with Neil deGrasse Tyson. That one was also absolutely wonderful. But there's something about Carl. I, I think of him as he, he's a deeply important person in my life. Open yourself up to the story that science has to tell because it is a beautiful story and it is it is a heartwarming story if you if you embrace it. Well said. And I argue in my book toward the end that we need to have a worldview that's based on reality. And, and not false beliefs, not mysticism, not inventions. There's a real world out there that can be understood using the tools of science. And we can understand so much about our place on the planet. And in fact, the, the planet itself and the planet as part of the solar system and as the solar system as part of the universe. We can understand all of that through the sciences that we have. And Carl Sagan does a tremendous job of that in his Cosmos series. Jared Diamond does a great deal of that in his work at looking at how societies formed the way they did because of geography and climate. And another book that people should look at is uh, Harari's, uh, Yuval Harari's uh, Sapiens, which is, a, which is the story of the human species. And uh, in that, he points out that uh, I think he says there were six hominid species before modern humans emerged 200,000 years ago. So we evolved out of a family of related hominids that weren't, weren't as smart as we are and maybe weren't as good at making tools as we are, but they were humanoid in the sense that they were more human than ape and they lived in social groups and they may have had some basic language of sorts like even animals have signals to each other, uh, vocalizations. So our ancestors weren't all just savages. There were, there were other humans, humanoids, hominids, before modern humans came, came along 200,000 years ago. And it's important to understand that because part of our culture is rooted in that as well. We didn't just have a culture spontaneously out of the wild blue yonder 200,000 years ago. Whatever we came into the world as modern humans 200,000 years ago was still the product of earlier hominids and their life ways and their tool use and their ideas about females and males and, and the world above them. They still had minds of maybe not as developed yet, but um, we need to understand that we came out of a long, long evolution of mammalhood and, and apehood. And it's and it's a fascinating story. It is as fascinating. In fact, it is more fascinating than anything you'll read in fiction or fantasy. Um, 
I, it sounds like you and I are both highly recommending to the reader that they should read up on their on the story that science has to tell. It is it is fascinating and it is important and it is the best way to understand the world in which we live. A reality based a reality based worldview. And how do we understand reality? We use the tools of science to understand the reality of the workings of the atom, uh, the whole science of chemistry. And from that, biochemistry and microbiology, we understand the formation of molecules and then cells and cell processes, the whole evolution of life itself that culminates in a lot of different kinds of species around the world, of which we are just one member. And our evolution was shaped just the way theirs was, and we need to understand all of that, and we do it through understanding reality, the real world that we live in. Jim, thank you so much. We've already taken up a lot of your time. To wrap up, could I just ask, is there anything you're working on now that you'll be willing to share with us? And I, I know that you're working on publishing a, a, an updated version of, of this book, An Unnatural Order. So if you could talk to us a little bit about that or anything else you're working on, that would be great. Yes, uh, the book that we've been discussing, An Unnatural Order, we're revising it. Uh, uh, we're condensing it and updating it. It'll be a slimmer volume, but it'll be uh, the same the same book, the same title, uh, and it'll come out in the spring of 2021 from Lantern Books. And um, what we tried to do is basically to streamline and simplify the book to focus on the formation of the worldview and to explain how animals are so important in the shaping of that worldview. Um, what I've done since the book first came out from Simon and Schuster in 1993, is I've uh, spun off a lot of essays, basically the central ideas of the book. One uh, one essay was entitled Mesothery uh, and how it changed the world. I think one of those essays is part of the Oxford Handbook, Animal Studies Handbook, um, Oxford University Press published that uh, seven or eight years ago. I've I've published the, the the basic ideas from an unnatural order in in several other places, and some of the um, central ideas of the book can be found on my website, uh, jimmason dot website, and um, I'm uh, working on interviews with um, Kip Anderson who did Cowspiracy, and that uh, new film I don't know the title of it yet, but that is probably going to be out in the spring of 2021 too. All of, all of these are spinoffs of the ideas in an unnatural order, the idea of the formation of our worldview of human supremacy and how animals were so central to the formation of that worldview. As I mentioned to you in email, cowspiracy is the reason that my wife and I both became vegan. We watched the movie and as the credits were rolling, we said, well, we guess we won't be eating any more dairy products ever again. That was seven, eight years ago, and, and, and we haven't. Jim, your book is a wonderful, amazing overview of the history of Western thought and its development and the origins of many of the problems that plague us, even into the present. I love your book. It is one of the great works in the animal rights literature, and it is a masterpiece in the history of ideas. I cannot recommend it more highly to all of our listeners. Thank you so much for writing it and for your time and insights today. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much, Mark, for uh, noticing the book and giving us such a good explanation and description to your listeners. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation. I've been speaking with Jim Mason about his book, An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Destruction of Nature. It's an erudite work, a compassionate and fascinating work, and an important one. It's also, as I've stressed multiple times now, a masterpiece. I hope that you will consider reading it. The theme music for this episode, for all my episodes, is composed and performed by Dan Lurch. I'm Mark Malloy. 
and you've been listening to the New Books and Animal Studies special series on the New Books Network. See you next time.